I just want to ask um, Christina and Jose, you both mentioned the dreamers. Yeah. Just for the purposes of our conversation, what, what are dreamers? Who are they? What you, go, is, Chris, you go, Christina. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, it's interesting because we um, actually started claiming the term dreamer uh, back in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, and when we refer to dreamers, which now I love the fact that we can talk about dreamers when we talk to media and we talk to reporters and they know who we're referring to, um, as opposed to the legal immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, dreamers are undocumented youth um, who have you know, grown up in this country like everybody else, um, gone to school, thinking they're Americans, thinking they belong here, claiming this as their home, this country as their home. Um, so those, um, you know, when we say dreamers, those are the folks that we're referring to. Um, and many of them have um, been committed to organizing, mobilizing communities and being leaders in, in their communities to create change around sure. immigration. Thank you, Christina. I think it's really interesting because both of your stories are so personal and they're so political. So really talk about the personal is political. I think that's incredible how you live that all of the time. Um, I want to move on to uh, Rinku now. And um, your organization has published a report called the Shattered Families Report. And I was wondering if you could just tell us about the main findings of that report and just how it sketches out the picture of what our policies actually end up doing to families, if you could speak sure. to that. Um, just a word of background. Am I close enough to the mic, do you think? Yeah, I think so. Just a word of background. The Applied Research Center does three things. Uh, one is that we produce media, and colorlines.com is our daily news site. We publish every day online and deal with really all of the nation's race news. And then we do research both into how uh, policies affect communities of color, but also what works in terms of making social change. And then the last thing we do is support through trainings and uh, meetings and coaching a big network of individuals and groups across the country who are really trying to put racial equity into action, implement it. So sh last fall, we broke a story about the fact that immigrant parents, when they are uh, either detained by immigration authorities or they're deported, can actually end up losing their kids permanently to the child welfare system. The, and by permanently, I don't mean that, oh, we're just living in different countries, my kid's in the United States and I'm in Mexico. I mean a court in the United States decided, terminated my parental rights, decided I am no longer the parent of this child, and this child is now eligible for adoption. So we heard the first story about um, kids who were stuck in foster care when their mother was deported in 2004, probably. Uh, while I was in journalism school looking for a magazine story, I came across this one family. And, um, and I thought, well, if it's happened to this one family, then it's got to be happening more across the country. But it took us four or five years to raise enough, to generate enough resources to actually really do a deep dive into how much this is happening and uh, to whom it's happening and how you could change it. And initially, a lot of people told us it's not happening. The immigrant rights group said, well, we don't know of people whose kids end up in the child welfare system or foster care. And um, it was so, it was a piece of collateral damage that was so on the edge of everything that even people devoted to immigrant rights didn't know that it was happening. So, and no one keeps these numbers. The child welfare departments don't keep them. ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement doesn't keep them. So we had to go uh, department by department to big child welfare departments across the country and high states with lots of immigrants and actually get people to tell us in their current caseloads how many of the parents they were dealing with had been deported and how many of uh, these families were in danger of this permanent separation. And from doing that research, we came up with a very conservative figure that there are 5,000 kids across the country in child welfare departments who are in danger of never seeing their parents again, basically. And um, just today, as a matter of fact, there was 
uh, really sad, outrageous court ruling in a Missouri case, the case of Encarnacion Bayil. This case doesn't involve child welfare, but it's very similar. Encarnacion was working in a factory in Missouri and it was raided by ICE. She had made an arrangement if, if she got caught in a raid like that, that a couple that she knew, a white Missouri couple, would take care of her child until she could make arrangements to, to get Carlos. Her, baby, her son was a baby at that point. She was uh, deported to Guatemala and the couple initiated adoption proceedings, got a judge to declare the mother having abandoned the child and essentially did an illegal adoption and that case has been appealed several times, but the Missouri Supreme Court today ruled against Encarnacion Bail and in favor of um, the adoptive parents. Mm -hmm. So what we wanted to show in the, by doing this report was um, we wanted Americans to actually think about the things that are done in their names and to feel, uh, to make an emotional connection to the consequences of those things, to the harm that that does. And we wanted people to understand that immigration policy isn't just something you work out in the abstract. It's about national borders and something that Congress deals with and something that doesn't affect anybody I know or people I care about. Um, most Americans have had the experience of either being someone's child or being someone's parent. Well, I guess everyone has been someone's child. Um, and many people have been someone's parent. And so the reason we stuck to that story for five years when everybody was telling us, like, just forget about it, is that we knew it was happening because, again, if there's one, there are going to be more, just, just as Christina figured out. And, um, and it wasn't the usual kind of story that you hear about family separation. It was a you know, permanent legal child is essentially abducted and adopted by white people kind of story. So it had uh, both a jaw-dropping systemic problem and um, a deep emotional impact. And um, it is, even though it's on the edge of child welfare and immigration, I mean, most Americans don't deal with the child welfare system, which is um, deeply messed up in itself. Um, but even though it was on the edge, we thought that the themes, you know, the harm to the children, the um, devastation of the parents, the themes would resonate with many, many people. And we hoped certainly to create policy change out of it, which is in process, although not nearly at the speed or the scale at which I think it should be happening. Uh, we wanted to interrupt the immigration discourse. And um, we, you know, for us, a good goal was if our story went up on um, some newspaper's online version, and then we looked at the comment threads, the comment threads on immigration stories, whether the story is positive or negative about immigrants, the comment threads are always horrible. They're, you know, the right wing trolls those comment threads. And, um, and so on most of those comment threads, you'll see, you know, 30 comments in a row that are like, oh, they deserve what they get and, you know, deport them all and um, on the edge of violence. But in the comment threads about our story, you know, maybe the fifth one in, somebody would say, well, I don't like those illegals, but I'm not sure that this is the right thing to have happen. I don't know if this is really okay. So for us, that felt like a significant victory to just to get people to put themselves in another person's shoes, something I think the dreamers have done quite brilliantly, um, and then to actually question whether the human impact of the policies that they have been supporting up to that point is an acceptable impact to them. It's an impact, whether or not that's an impact that they can live with. Thank you so much, Rinku. That was really informative. Um, Karen, you work with the New York Immigration Coalition, as I mentioned. And I was hoping that for the purposes of our discussion tonight, you could really frame the current political context of the immigration debate and the issue. And particularly, if you could comment on the prevailing narrative around immigration. Um, so when I think about the sort of political and narrative context for the immigration debate, um, it's exasperating and it's even heartbreaking. 
And then there's also this exhilarating piece. Um, I, you know, I think right now we're in a place where immigration is clearly the wedge issue. Um, it has not had the sea change that same-sex marriage has had. It, it sort of has continued in this sort of the cycle we've seen throughout American history of really um, anti-immigrant waves and then they recede and then they come back again. And the one that we're in now I think is very much driven by the sort of increasing radicalization of um, the Republican Party um, and a certain timidity on the other side of the aisle as well. But it really began, um, and I mean, some of these issues have been bipartisan historically. Um, you have the DREAM Act. It was introduced over a uh, 10 years ago, um, bipartisan. Um, it had Republican and Democratic sponsors. Um, at this point, you don't have Republicans behind it at all. Um, you also don't even have some Democrats behind it. Um, you know, we had McCain in 2006, 2007, partnering with Senator Kennedy to sponsor um, a Im comprehensive immigration reform bill that would have sort of done a very huge overhaul of our immigration system. And he, he, was, he was the author of it. He garnered other Republican support. Um, within a year, he was, or a year and a half, he's running for president, and he said he wouldn't even support that bill, even though he'd written it. Um, so there's been this increasing, like, um, political division there. Um, although it's nothing new, I mean, I sort of feel like the wave we're in now kind of began in the early 90s. Um, you had Pete Wilson in California doing Proposition 187 that would have been made it illegal for parents to send undocumented children to school, um, which, you know, was unconstitutional. Um, and it sort of, a lot of this stuff culminated in 96 with these very, um, onerous anti-immigrant laws um, passed by Congress, um, the 1996 um, Illegal Immigration Reform and Responsibility Act, IRA-IRA, um, which hugely expanded detention, deportation, um, and then the Welfare Reform Act, which actually imposed a lot of cuts, not just on, uh, I mean, you know, as welfare, reform, welfare got scaled back, the people who bore the brunt of it were actually even lawful permanent residents, people who live here, who pay taxes, who pay into that system, and then were suddenly restricted um, from using it. Um, so it's sort of been this wave, and then you had 9-11, which sort of then suddenly conflates immigration with national security, and then you go um, into a really faltering economy, which has really ramped things up. And so then you have this great political division in D.C., nothing happening in Congress. It leaves an opening for opportunistic politicians at the local and state level to say they're going to take matters into their own hands and, you know, pursue anti-immigrant laws at the local and state level. Um, so you have Arizona, you have Alabama, you have, and then the small towns. So you have, um, Hazleton, Pennsylvania was like the ground zero of local anti-immigrant ordinances. Um, the then mayor, who is now in Congress, um, path, put, tried to pass or did pass these very anti-immigrant measures, um, making it illegal to rent to someone who's undocumented. I mean, all this stuff. A lot laying the groundwork for what ends up happening in Arizona, in Alabama, and other localities. Most of which, none of which really were able to be implemented because they were all held up in this court, court cases. Ha Hazleton basically has bankrupted itself um, trying to defend these cases, th this case. Um, and the thing that was really ironic with that, um, not to go on too long, but, um, you know, Hazleton was a rust belt, like dying town, aging population, young people moving away, it's, it's old sort of manufacturing base basically gone. Um, and so as part of the mayor's sort of economic development strategy, he wanted to establish these industrial parks, bring in big warehouses and this and that. He does that, but he doesn't have a labor force in the town. So what happens? You have immigrants come in, they fill these jobs, they rebuild this economy in this town, 
And then the very people on whom he's depending for his economic development goals, he then decides to malign because he figures that way he can ride this. You know, there's going to be tensions when demographics change. And, you know, so he rides that tension um, basically to try to ride himself into national office by doing this whole anti-immigrant um, sort of uh, campaign. Um, so you have inaction in D.C. You have um, state and local opportunists basically clamping down on that. Um, and then, you know, the bad economy. Um, and so the political context is pretty depressing. Mm. And, you know, the one thing you take hope is, is that there are cycles and we're just in a really lousy cycle. Um, the narrative is basically pretty ugly. Um, it's, and it's sort of, at this point, it's, it's kind of formed by the sort of the incremental um, kind of demonization of immigrants. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, they're the bad guys. They won't do the right thing. They're just coming in, they're flouting our laws, they're, you know, um, you know, uh, they're the ones at fault. And never look that it's actually the immigration system that's totally antiquated, totally outdated, um, doesn't in any way address our national needs, um, and doesn't provide an adequate legal framework for immigration. Um, and what's been very particularly frustrating, I've found, as somebody in the sort of immigrant advocacy world, um, I think sometimes we have run the risk of, of kind of, in a way, um, accommodating that narrative. Mm. Um, there was a lot of sort of, over the past several years, there was this wave of polling, you know, as you're trying to determine what messages resonate with the American people. and. Uh, so this feeling that, um, you know, if you frame it as people just need to get right with the law and they need to pay the penalties and they need to do this and they need to get right with the law, then you see that people are open to a legalization program for the 10 plus million undocumented people here. But the thing is, maybe that kind of might resonate in an, a country that sort of might pride itself on being a nation that's governed by the rule of law. Um, but I don't know how you in any way can then take that and move policy if your premise is that these people have done the wrong thing and it's not the system that needs changing, they're the ones who are at fault. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, um, I think sometimes we need to think what resonates but how would or would that not translate into the kind of policy change you're seeking. Mm -hmm. um, and. So that's sort of like the narrative, I think, the prevailing narrative. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. But here's the exhilarating part. Um, I do think that, um, I think that a lot of the debate has been sort of hijacked by the sort of very far lunatic fringe um, that, you know, of basically peddling hate. Um, but I don't think that that is actually sort of um, indicative of where the country as a whole stands, even though we're in this weird acquiescent phase. Um, and I think the, the exhilarating part is seeing, you know, dream kids coming out, the sense that they're not gonna hide in the shadows, they're not gonna let these, um, this terrible system um, take them down, and they're gonna confront it. And it's, I, you know, we have just gotten to work with and know so many amazing young people who are also imbued with this incredible optimism and, um, like, positive energy. Um, and, you know, you do see um, more of an emphasis around voting. Um, we're not where we need to be, but there's an increasing sense that immigrant communities want to get out. They want their voices heard. Um, in the 2008 election, you had, um, we do an ex we've done exit polls um, to sort of, sort of see where immigration stuff plays out in each election and to sort of provide some sort of sense of who the immigrant electorate is. And in our exit poll in 2008, um, we found that, you know, nearly half of all first-time voters in the election 
were immigrants. Um, and so immigrants are really key to expanding our electorate. Um, Absolutely. I think it's a, a really important question, and I want to um, circle back to that a little bit later, but thank you for bringing that up. Jose, I just wanted to turn to you as well. Um, just to dovetail a little bit on what Karen was talking about, um, you said on, on Huffington Post that immigration is arguably the most fundamentally misunderstood issue in America. And I was just wondering if you could e explain why you hold that opinion. And I was also interested in what you think the core reasons are um, for the nature of our current immigration policies and some of the blocking that's happening politically to, to movement and reform. Um, OK, I'll try to be succinct. Um, <laughs> Reporting has always been my religion, so <laughs> journalism has always been my church. So a lot of what I've done in the past year, I've done about 60 different events, like town hall meetings, panels, whatever, in 20 different states in about a year. Mm -hmm. So Arizona, Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, Arkansas, Florida, Ohio, Iowa, meeting with Tea Party people. Um, this is what I've always done. So I went, talked to people, and the gap between perception and reality was so wide, you could probably fit Alaska in it with Sarah Palin sitting right in the middle. <laughs> um, the, gap was just, the gap was just so wide in terms of what people think the issue is mm -hmm. or, who they, or, or who they think we even are, right? And you know, I mean, that's always an interesting thing when you face what you fear. You realize that you really fear something really within yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I remember being in uh, in Birmingham, outside of Birmingham, at a Coles department store, and <laughs> when once the woman realized, you know, of course, I'm like, by the way, when you say illegal, I'm like, what are these people you're talking about? She goes, but you speak English so good. <laughs> <laughs> I do not correct her. Uh, so you're not you're not from Mexico. No, I'm from the Philippines. What's that? Oh. 100 million people in it. Um, I, this, the sense of just ignorance, and this is where the media, which is where, you know, in some ways, and you know, it's so easy to blame the media. It's the mm -hmm. easiest thing to do. But I think from the, media's, from the media's perspective, this has been one of those issues that they just don't know what to do with. They have put it in a box. It's just brown people, it's just Mexico, it's the border in our minds, mm -hmm. right? And tying what is happening to this country that is, I mean, look, what is the political context? The political context is that people still think President Barack Obama doesn't have the right birth certificate. If they're questioning the president's birth certificate, of course they're gonna question our passports and our social security numbers. So what is this really about? You have to tie the immigration problem, such as it is, to this larger question of the evolving American identity. The fact that this country looks different. The fact that you go to all the states in this country, the biggest cities in this country, and you see brown people. You know What was the report that came out of Pew? Basically saying that Asian people in the past decade had driven more immigration to this country than even the Latino population did in the past decade, right? So the country is only going to get browner, more Asian, in some words, gayer. More and more people will also come out about that. More women will be in positions of power. I know this enough because I've confronted this enough. You talk to white conservative people in the South or in the Midwest, they feel like their country is being taken away from them, mm -hmm. right? And you know, I actually sympathize with that. I see where that's coming from. But the problem is, instead of us actually confronting it, and saying my existence doesn't threaten yours. We are not taking away a slice of your pie. Actually, we're, whole, we're making the pie bigger. You know, like these are the kind of conversations that's not happening a lot of the time because we haven't created the right space for it to happen. And again, I cannot overemphasize the need. What is that great Hannah Arendt quote, right? Storytelling reveals meaning without committing the error of defining it. I am not some political box. I am not some punching bag. <laughs> and to me, the mistake, and the, not the mistake, but 
the short-sightedness in the policy front has had to do with the dehumanization of the whole issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at where we stand. We're called illegal. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any other issue in which you refer to a group of people as illegal? We don't call people illegal drivers. We call them underage drivers or drunk drivers, right? But we have completely looked at one group of people and decided to call them illegal and be that okay. That's how big the gap is. And I think by the fact that the dreamers have come out and the fact that the dream movement in some ways have really reignited um, the immigration movement, I think that has put human faces and names and stories um, to the fore and have people confront those. And that's why I think for me, storytelling has been a really big game changer in how we talk about this issue and how we look at it. Now, the question moving forward is, how are we gonna force the media? How are we gonna force the politicians? And more importantly, how are we gonna force each other to look each other in the face and actually talk about this? Because we run to our corners, you know? How many more conversations like this can be happening in Kansas and Kentucky and Arkansas where it needs to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely.